So I just picked a few injuries that we see relatively commonly uh, throughout the winter to talk about. Uh, there are a lot more out there, and I'm happy to field any questions I can about more specific injuries moving forward. Uh, so here's what uh, I laid out just to talk about briefly. So we're going to talk about meniscal tears in the knee. We're going to talk about ankle fractures, uh, ruptures of the Achilles, and then we'll, we'll stop with uh, tibial shaft fractures. And really, it's, I, I, I go from the top to the bottom of tibial, shaft, of tibial fractures. So we'll start off with, uh, with meniscal tears. So this is a view of your knee. This is the bones in your knee. This is your right knee looking from the front. Here's your kneecap, your patella, the fibula, the tibia, and the femur. And if we cut this in half and then look down from above, this is the view that we see. We're talking about these two structures that live on either side of your knee. Uh, this is showing the ACL and the PCL section here. And this here is the tear of the meniscus. So what is it? What are these things? Uh, the menisci are two bumpers, essentially, that live in your knee, and they have a couple different functions. One, they, uh, they spread out the force in your knee, and they provide some degree of restraint. But predominantly, uh, they're acting to, uh, to spread out some of the forces that you see with load bearing. And you have one on the inside and one on the outside of your knee. Some of the other structures that you see here that you commonly hear about, ACL, PCL, and the collateral ligaments on either side that stabilize the knee. So the meniscus is interesting because only a certain part of it has the ability to heal on its own. So if we look at the picture down here on the bottom, uh, this is looking again that cut through the top. And you can see that the, the meniscus goes from red to white. And that represents the area of the meniscus that gets blood supply from the outside. So the blood vessels live on the outside of the knee, and they send blood vessels into the meniscus, but they only make it about halfway. And the inside of the meniscus gets all its nourishment from the synovial fluid that bathes it. Uh, and consequently, uh, it can't heal because it doesn't have blood supply in order to bring all the uh, factors that we need to heal from there. Uh, so uh, meniscal tears come in a bunch of different flavors. The upper right-hand corner shows some of those different types of tears. But they can essentially be uh, lumped into those that are associated with injury or traumatic tears and those that are associated with degenerative tears. So either something acute happens and you end up with a tear, uh, or uh, the wear and tear in your knee creates essentially a rough surface that, that eats away at the meniscus and can cause tears. So if we're talking about acute tears, how can those happen? Typically, it's with some sort of hyperextension or deep flexion injury somewhere at the extremes of motion of the knee. Uh, it could be a twisting injury. And again, that wear and tear uh, can happen just with arthritis in the knee. So this is a little bit of what it looks like. This is looking inside with the arthroscope. On the left here is what a, a normal meniscus looks like. This is the femur up on the top. This is the tibia on the bottom. And this structure here is the meniscus on the periphery. Uh, and that's a nice, clean meniscus with a sharp edge. And you can see here there's an instrument that's been introduced that's hooking around a tear and pulling it into the joint. And essentially, we think about it kind of like a pebble in your shoe. If you have this piece of or flat meniscus that's moving in and out of the joint every time you move it or walk, uh, it can be painful and potentially painful. So how do you know if you have it? Typically, uh, People with meniscal tears have pain right on the joint line. So it's typically either on the inside or on the outside. And you can pinpoint it right to one place right there. And if you go into, uh, into one of our offices, typically someone cruel will push right on that place and make you, make you jump. Uh, the, the other way that you know you might have a meniscal tear is what we call mechanical symptoms. So catching, popping, blocking. If your knee sticks in one position, you kind of have to move it, and there's a thunk, and then it goes back to moving okay. That's a pretty sure sign that, that you have a meniscal tear. Um, people ask about uh, popping and kind of uh, crepitus or Rice Krispies all the time in their shoulders and their knees, sometimes in their hips. And in general, those kind of like little pops and clicks that you, you feel without pain are perfectly normal. What, makes them happen, I don't really know. There's, I've heard all sorts of things about uh, vacuum phenomena, but the long and short of it is nobody really knows. It's essentially the same thing as cracking your knuckles. And swelling. Typically, if you get an acute meniscal tear, your knee will blow up because it's uh, been filled up with blood. So how's it treated? A lot of that depends on the location of the, 
of the tear, how old the person is, any associated injuries, and the presence of arthritis in the knee. Because uh, once you have arthritis in your knee, you have a meniscal tear associated with it. A lot of instances, uh, the cow's kind of already out of the barn, and dealing with the meniscal tear won't necessarily deal with the core problem of degenerative changes. So the most conservative end of things, uh, physical therapy and injections with things like steroids or sometimes visco supplementation uh, can help calm down a knee. Well, it may not cure a tear that's in that area that won't uh, heal. It can make it less symptomatic and allow people to get back to what they need to do. And then there are two basic surgical options, either cutting out the torn meniscal fragment, which is probably done a lot more commonly, or repairing the torn meniscal fragment. So physical therapy, we touched on a bit. This is uh, uh, an injection into the knee, uh, not necessarily done with physical therapy, but both of those have the potential to provide significant relief, especially if you have a degenerative meniscal tear associated with some uh, arthritis. Um, again, we talked about kind of cutting out that pebble in your shoe. Here you can see this rough torn edge. And here's what it looks like after uh, instruments are introduced into the knee to bite away at it. Um, if the tear is outside the area that will heal. It's a certain type of tear pattern uh, or degenerative tears. Oftentimes, those are treated uh, with this sort of procedure. And again, this is done much more commonly. And then sometimes that tear is repaired. So this is what's called a bucket handle tear. If you imagine in three dimensions, this can kind of flop in and out of the joint. And if it flops into the joint, it can stick in one place, and, and your knee can get stuck in that position. Uh, especially if these are acute tears, if they're in the right position, so they're in that red zone where they can heal, oftentimes these are treated with, uh, with repair. This is just a little uh, drawing of how that's done. Um, there are lots of gizmos out there, but it's some variation on placing sutures or suture anchors across the fracture, or excuse me, across the tear and allowing it to heal. The difference between these two, if you have your piece of meniscus torn out, people usually Sometimes within a day, oftentimes, most often within two weeks, are back to normal. Their pain is improved, uh, maybe not all the way, but most of the way, uh, and they're back to doing what they want to do. If you need to have your meniscus repaired, it's a much longer recovery period. It involves a non weight bearing period, oftentimes a constant motion machine. There's a lot more rules. And then sometimes, sometimes they just don't heal. <laughs> All right, so ankle fractures, um, which can occur really in any sport, winter or otherwise. And actually, probably this guy has a tibia fracture, not an ankle fracture, but well, I'm not. So what is it? So, so your ankle is composed of three bones, the talus, which is uh, in the middle, uh, and lower down in your ankle. And then the tibia, which comes down and forms what we call uh, the medial malleolus on the side here. And then your fibula, which comes down and forms the lateral malleolus on the outside of the ankle. So tibia and medial malleolus on the inside, tibia and lateral malleolus on the outside. And it's in, in conjunction with that, you, when you injure your ankle severely, you can either break bones or you can uh, rupture ligaments. And typically they're done uh, in association, and usually it's one or the other. One gives way before the other one will. So how does it happen? Essentially, it's a twisting injury on a planted or restrained foot. So this is just a little video that shows what happens if your foot's planted and you have this rotational force around it. And it kind of shows the way that the force travels around your ankle with the most severe type of injuries. This is just one type of ankle fracture, but it's illustrative of basically all the mechanisms for ankle fractures that we know. You can see there are fractures occurring, and then here you're going to see ligaments rupture on the inside. Uh, uh, that kind of seals the deal and brings things 360 degrees around the ankle. So there's a whole bunch of patterns, right? Like the, there are a bunch of people who stuck their names in a bunch of different ways to classify these. Um, but it's basically dependent on what position your foot's in and then the direction of force that goes through your foot at the time uh, of the injury. Uh, and uh, different patterns are, can provide uh, different severity injuries. It's worth mentioning the syndesmosis. Um, hear a lot about uh, high ankle sprains. Um, these are essentially injuries to the syndesmosis. This is inter interesting because you can have what is essentially an ankle injury, ankle fracture, that presents with a fracture all the way up here uh, at the top of your knee. <clears throat> the syndesmosis is the ligament that runs between the tibia on the inside of your leg and the fibula on the outside. It essentially stabilizes those bones both longitudinally and side to side. 
Um, so you can have an injury to your ankle, again, planted foot, twisted, where the energy starts out on the inside of your ankle and travels all the way up through that ligament and presents with a, with a fracture up at the top. So you can see here, you know, there's no fracture down at the bottom here. The only fracture is up, up at the top. So this is still an ankle injury um, and uh, oftentimes requires surgery. And a high ankle sprain is essentially uh, a more modest version of this that doesn't have an associated fracture but can be can take a very long time to recover from it and can be really recalcitrant to treatment. So how do you know if you have it? Um, so these Ottawa ankle rules were created a, a while ago now, but they proved to be pretty, uh, pretty effective at ruling out people who uh, need x-rays. So if you hurt your ankle, and we'll start at the top here, you push on the outside or the inside of your ankle, you can feel the bone there that makes up your lateral malleolus and the medial malleolus. If it hurts right when you push on uh, the bone right there, that means you need an x-ray. If you, if you can't bear weight immediately after the injury, you, you know, you, you set it off, walk it off a little bit, uh, and then you still can't put weight on it, you need to go get an x-ray. That's what almost every emergency department uh, in the country is going to use to determine whether they're going to get an x-ray for you. So you can kind of use it as a first-line uh, defense to know if, if something is bad enough that you need to have it checked out. So how is it treated? Um, really, it's based on the stability of the joint. You saw how the energy in that video went circumferentially around the ankle. If more than two, more than one of the restraining structures of the ankle are injured, then it becomes an unstable pattern, one that we know responds better to surgery uh, than to non-operative treatment. Oftentimes, if just a single side of the ankle is fractured, um, you can get away with treating those in a cast and have uh, similar results afterwards. Um, and, and again, those injuries can be ligamentous or they can be fractures. And essentially, uh, casting is some combination of usually a short leg cast uh, and non-weight bearing for anywhere from six to eight weeks. Surgery involves plates and screws to, to put the fractures back together so they heal. But it's your own body doing the healing, so it still takes six to eight weeks usually until you're, you're back to full weight bearing. So we're talking a bit about uh, Achilles tendon ruptures, famous ones and maybe less famous ones. These are two of the big sports that uh, we see these with. So what is it? It's disruption of that ten the tendon that inserts onto the back of your calcaneus and essentially allows you to plantar flex or push your, uh, your toes down towards the ground. This is a depiction of it here. It goes all the way up and connects to uh, uh, two major muscles, one that attaches on the back of your tibia and fibula, one that goes all the way across your knee joint and attaches on the back of your femur. So usually this happens with an eccentric load with an extended knee. Um, so basketball, racket sports, especially squash, uh, are, uh, are often culprits. Uh, it's typically someone uh, a bit, you know, a middle-aged male, uh, decides they're going to play in the basketball, in their company basketball tournament, and in the first game, they feel a pop. Uh, there are certain medications that can be associated with this as well. Steroids <coughs> can cause weakening of the fibers of the tendon, it can lead to rupture. And some antibiotics have been associated with it as well, fluoroquinolones, things like ciprofloxacin, um, can be associated with tendon ruptures as well. How do you know if you have it? This is kind of a video here. That guy's squeezing that leg, and you see when he squeezes the calf on the left, causes the guy's foot to flex. But when he does it on, so that's the good side. When he does it here, you can see squeezing that calf causes no flexion of the ankle. And he's feeling for a palpable defect there, where you can oftentimes feel a divot from where the uh, Achilles tendon has, has ruptured. Um, almost. Universally, if you're playing a racket sport, even if you're not, if you're playing with someone else, some people say that they, they thought that someone had hit them in the back of the leg, someone had thrown something at them. Um, oftentimes, people feel a pop, it's painful, and uh, there's weakness pushing off because that's the main muscle that helps you plantar flex your ankle. Um, so these are important to catch early because uh, both, well, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but. Uh, the sooner that you can be casted in the appropriate position, essentially, or splinted, to bring those two tendon ends together so they're touching, the quicker you're going to get on the road to recovery, no matter which way, uh, which way you head. This shows someone who's, who's casted in what we call the Aquinas position with their toe uh, pointing down. And that's kind of where you want to be um, as early as possible after an Achilles tendon rupture. 
So I'll just treat it. This has gone through uh, evolution uh, recently. So the old uh, data would tell us that uh, if you ruptured your Achilles tendon, you treated it non-operatively, you had a higher rate of re-rupture, but a less chance of complication, which makes sense because you don't have to go through the surgical uh, risks of bleeding, infection, and especially in uh, these surgeries, risk of wound breakdown. Um, surgery came with a higher risk of complication, but less risk of uh, re-rupture and greater strain. So that mainly was in the area of people placing people in a cast and letting them sit there while things healed uh, and then taking them out of it and, and letting, them, letting them go. Uh, what we know now is that motion, you know, this is not surprising, motion is good for everything. Motion is good for cartilage, motion is good uh, for ligaments and tendons. And so um, some of the, the best uh, level one or the highest level studies that we have now and tell us that people who go into bracing and early range of motion with restriction on how high up you can bring your foot, so you're not separating those tendons, uh, tendon ends, they live right next to each other and you're moving them together, those people will do just as well as the people who have surgery uh, to repair them and you avoid the risks. Um, that includes uh, uh, strength. People, uh, the, the best studies we have would say that the strength is the same uh, when you come out the other end. Um, now, there are caveats to that, including how early this is caught. And um, nobody I know of has been, everybody's been too chicken to, to treat professional athletes that way uh, because of the concern that they won't end up as strong. Because if once, once you treat it non-operatively, you kind of lost, once you get a couple weeks out, you've lost the opportunity to repair it primarily. Uh, but uh, I went to a conference recently with eight foot and ankle orthopedic surgeons, and seven of the eight would treat their Achilles rupture in a cast on the left as opposed to the surgery on the right. There are times to do surgery, but maybe not as often as we think. So how do you avoid it? Really, it's, it's avoiding being a weekend that warrior, right? Like, you know, playing flag football every two weeks is not the way to stay in shape. Uh, and before you join the company basketball tournament, you should make sure that you've done some training to get back up to uh, your 18-year-old fitness level. <laughs> so we'll go through this a little bit. Uh, tibia fractures is a pretty broad topic, and there are kind of a lot of uh, subcategories, but it is an injury that we see often associated with uh, downhill skiing. So what is it? This is again looking at the tibia up here is the top that articulates with your femur to make your knee joint. Again, here's that fibula in between the syndesmosis, and down here is where the, uh, the ankle joint lives. So fractures of the tibia can, can occur on top, what's called a plateau fracture that oftentimes, usually, will go into the knee joint. They can happen in the middle of the bone, in what's uh, called the tibial shaft or down at the base and go into the ankle joint, that's called a tibial pilon fracture. Pilon fractures are differentiated from ankle, ankle fractures in that these are high energy compression injuries as opposed to twisting injuries. So how does it happen? It's oftentimes with a fall or a crash. It can be a relatively low energy crash, uh, but oftentimes it's a higher energy crash. Tibial plateau fractures are typically from a blow on the side of the leg or some combination of compression. You can imagine if you're, off, you, you're going fast enough, you uh, generate enough force that oftentimes just the turning or the valgus moment on your knee, the bending end of your knee, can cause enough force to uh, uh, create a fracture in the right circumstances. Tibial shaft fractures are uh, easier to, to understand. I mean, you put your foot in a rigid boot that's very solid, and you have a big lever arm on it with your ski, and you twist through that ski, that energy travels up and it cre can create this twisting fracture uh, of, your, uh, of your leg. Uh, those fractures can happen often, or can happen with a direct blow to the side of your leg as well, but more often in a ski uh, injury, it's at the top of a ski boot. And then peel fractures are typically compression fractures, so big jumps uh, that can cause a calcaneus fracture, a heel bone fracture, it can also cause um, one of these fractures. So how do you know you have it? Well, this is typically the view that you have after you have suffered. <laughs> this is not a questionable, I wonder if I hurt myself uh, type of injury. These are usually high energy injuries that you can't get up from. Uh, although it's not a bad view. So how is it treated? If you're talking about tibial plateau fractures, again, these are fractures that go up into the knee joint. Those can be either on the outside or on the inside of the articular surface of, of the knee. Uh, and it, 
with the exception of very rare cases where they're, they're non-displaced, these are typically treated uh, with surgery with plates and screws to hold things together. Oftentimes, for visually, they're treated with an external fixator, which is pins and bars that live outside the skin that allow swelling to decrease. Tibial shaft fractures, those in the middle of the bone, can be treated in one of two ways. Uh, if they are relatively non-displaced, um, and uh, they reduce well in a cast. They can oftentimes be treated with a cast. Usually that requires a time of casting above the knee, so it's a relatively awkward cast, but uh, it avoids the complications or potential complications of surgery. The other main way that these are treated is with what's called a tibial nail, uh, which comes in from above through essentially just the anterior to the knee joint, and this cylindrical piece of metal that goes across the fracture holds it reduced with screws above and below uh, and allows you to oftentimes uh, move your knee a bit earlier and weight bear a bit earlier, but also comes with the risk associated with surgery. Tibial pilon fractures are, are arguably the worst of this group uh, next to plateau fractures. Uh, they typically uh, result in highly comminuted fractures, fractures in a lot of different pieces. You know, each of these little uh, vanilla <coughs> particles here is a separate piece that contains joint. Uh, that used to be nice and shiny and smooth and uh, is no longer and never will be, no matter how well put together. Uh, those are typically treated with, again, external fixation, pins and bars outside the skin that allow the swelling to decrease uh, until uh, time that surgical fixation can be implemented, either with small incisions and screws that hold the pieces together, or oftentimes large plates and lots of screws to hold them together. All right, that's it.